Welcome to Outside Game, the podcast. I am the host with the most, Keith Bullock, with my ace, Don Povia, riding shotgun. Mr. Monday Night with the multiple nicknames. You just give them to yourself, though, don't you? Yeah, of course. That's how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have another one, Casey Starbuck. Casey Starbuck, yeah. Mr. Monday Night, the host with the most. I mean, I just I feel like I got to do something out the gate, you know, the podcast. It, you finally got me on the mic, so I got to do it right. Did you ever talk to Drew Brees about that nickname? Um, I haven't, but um, you know what? Uh, friends of mine that have met Drew Brees has actually uh, brought it up before. Um, a good friend of mine in Tennessee um, that's in the group Little Big Town, I guess, um, Philip, uh, well, Philip Sweet. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say his name, but um, <laughs> I was gonna say Drew, and, and they were at a, you know, I guess an event together, and um, he brought my name up. Philip did, and Drew was like, "Yeah, I remember that guy. <laughs> <laughs> remember that guy. Remember that game. But yeah, it was a good night that night. So you, you've come a long way from your playing career, but here we are. So what are we doing here? Man, look, we're getting on the mic, doing this podcast. This outside, the uh, outside game is something that." You know, you and I created based off your blogs with balls history that you created uh, 10 years ago with um, some partners of yours. And I thought it was a great event the times that you had me come. I like that the platforms that you provided were free speaking, meaning that, you know, there were topics and not everybody on those platforms were necessarily going to agree with what was said. But, you know, you were able to start a conversation and. Um, probably most of those conversations had already been started, but with that particular event, uh, you can get more into depth with them and actually, you know, bring it to life to other people who may not be aware. And also instead of people yelling at each other, we put them together or I shouldn't even say yelling to each other or with each other. They're just yelling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Cause, all right, let's formalize this a little bit and talk about it. And, um, yeah, so obviously it's not obvious to those who weren't there, but right. we did our first outside game event at Subculture back in September um, where we had five different, four or five different panels um, with some great panelists, some great topics, and it's on our website, so you guys can go check that out if you'd like. But, um, yeah, moving forward, we're going to keep this ball rolling with our podcast to keep doing – more of the same things, getting interesting guests to tell about their journey, as well as sometimes it'll just be you and I on here to just talk about things that, you know, are being spoke about, but not really being spoke about in depth. And we were trying to be blunt, too, when we did that event, when we were coming up with topics that we wanted to talk about and panels and stuff. It's not your typical sports business or sports marketing or sports this. It was more like, let's just be frank. What are we talking about when we're having a beer? What are we talking about at the water cooler? So uh, Pac-Man Jones came and talked about his journey, right? People have an assumption of, of who he is and what he is. Well, let's let him have a forum to kind of talk about that and maybe help somebody. Robin Lehner talking about mental health. We had a number of female uh, executives, athletes talking about the struggles that they go through. Um, yeah, it was uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Ca Casillas, Casillas yeah, hopefully. came in and shed some light on the whole CBD industry as well as uh, cannabis in general. You know, him being having multiple, you know, injuries and playing on Super Bowl teams, winning Super Bowl championships. Um, I can't relate to the Super Bowl championships. <laughs> um, but, yeah, some in I definitely had um, a couple injuries uh, during, uh, during my career that I'm sure CBD probably could have helped. Well, it, more importantly, what he spoke about was the hypocrisy of, of the drugs that are available to players yeah, versus yeah, the ones that much. are, you know, that, that draw these red flags. So, yeah, now that was good, and, and hopefully we're going to take some of those conversations here. But going back to just the bluntness of those conversations, it was like, all right, women, weed, <laughs> yeah, right? for real, mental health. Like, let's just cut right to the chase and do it. And, and that's what we're going to do here. We're just going to cut to the chase and, and shoot the shit. Yeah, man. So, you know, to give you guys, give you listeners a background of how we came together, um, if you're not familiar, I played in the National Football League for 11 years, a three-time All-Pro with the Tennessee Titans in my last year. I spent with the New York Giants, um, and, you know, I had come to meet Don through one of my best friends who was in the marketing business. I believe, what did you, where were you working at the time? 
I think I was just uh, doing my own freelance. HHR. Yeah. Yeah. Which was which was the blog hugging Harold Reynolds and blogs of balls back in those wild west days of the internet. Uh, but yeah, I, I ended up building such great relationships that I started my own company. Was doing consulting and. We were working on uh, something with your friend, and I remember you said something to him like, "How are you getting this guy with no name from you know Central New York, you know all these things?" And and he introduced us, and it wasn't really professional. We just kind of yeah, no, just know, hung out. Yeah, if, if paths cross, they cross. And then I think you were at my house for a Kentucky Derby party with your your wife and your kids, and uh, we just started talking. You said, "Hey, I'm going back to school. I'm doing this sports business thing at GW." And uh, let's talk about maybe doing something together professionally, and we did. And we did, and um, you know, we we started a creative agency called Transition Sports and Entertainment, where um, I don't work too closely with them, but I'm definitely still involved, and they're still doing great things. Uh, Shannon Judd is definitely handling her business in that aspect. Well, I needed that. I think we needed that yeah, as a company sure. because someone to come over and right. take control, professionalize what we were doing. <laughs> I think. You know, you mentioned creative agency earlier, and I think that's what it was. Like, you had a perspective of what athletes need. And really, the whole concept when you when we started talking about this is how do you take the best practices that you use for, say, corporate clients and apply them to athletes who are talking about being more than an athlete and talking about being a business, but a guy like yourself that played 11 years in the league, you're going back to school when you're 30-some years old without a resume, without any sort of <laughs> yeah. background other than playing a sport, which is great, but how do you leverage that opportunity that you had into something that's more sustainable for the rest of your career, for, yeah. for the rest of your life? Yeah, and for me, man, like, as a player, and most players, I, I can only speak for myself, but I always knew that I expanded more than just being an athlete. I was a foster kid, so when I started playing football, it was for the love of the game, and then in about 16... I was getting looks. I How big NC. were you then? 16. I was probably about six. I was definitely 6'3 at the time, but definitely 170 soaking wet. <laughs> and um, I remember NC State came. Sound like a wideout. Yeah, I was. I played wide out <laughs> and free safety and occasional occasional running back. I actually switched to full-time running back my junior year. I was an all-state running back, actually. But, um yeah, NC State came. I saw that I can get a scholarship. I was going to age out of foster care at um, 18. I was 16 at the time, so and I didn't necessarily have the best grades then. And it was back in the day when you had the moving scale, so I had to really work my ass off to kind of get some... Moving scale for athletes? Uh, for moving or... scale. What I mean by moving scale was um, in order to be eligible to get a scholarship, you ha it was based on your GPA. So if you had a 2.1 GPA, you would have to have like a like your higher SAT. higher SAT yeah. score. So that's, that's what I say, a moving scale. So I was able to get my... I would have qualified anyway because I got, you know, about uh, a little under 1,000. That's all I need. I think I only needed like seven hundred. So over, over, I'll kick the coverage. <laughs> That's you sign <laughs> your name. You get you get yeah, your six hundred. You know, so, so I went to Syracuse. Uh, Not a bad school. As a as a strong safety, and lo and behold, I was able to make it to the NFL. Well, you play with a, a handful of guys there that made it to the league. Yeah, man. The first guy that I witnessed like at another level of football was Marvin Harrison. Um, the approach that he took to practice was something obviously that I'd never seen coming out of Rockland County, New York, um, being the best player, you know, on my team. Um, I definitely had no work ethic when I got there after watching him and then some of the other guys were there. McNabb was a freshman then. Um, yeah, Freeney came along later. We had Donovan Darius to Bucky John. Yeah, we, we were pretty good, man. <laughs> we, we were pretty good. Uh, Dominating the Big East. Pretty good. Uh, Rest in peace. Football squad. Shout out to those Syracuse guys. But, yeah, you had a, a, a quick football career. You had a flash in the pan at Monmouth. In college it was quick, but I started playing at five or six. Mm -hmm. Played three years of flag, two years of midget, two or three years of bantam. Um, high school, I, I wanted to be a wide receiver. I knew I couldn't throw, but I had played Pee Wee League quarterback because I, right. I could take control, I could manage a game. And, you know, I went out for – I wanted to go after wide receiver. They're like, no, no, try quarterback. And they realized there was another guy that was better than me, which right. I was like, I tried to Perfect. tell you that. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I remember, so I guess it was freshman year, I got called up to JV, and the varsity head coach saw me playing wide receiver, 
and was like, don't move him back. He's he's going to be a wide receiver. So right. junior year, I ended up leading the county. I was second in the county by like one catch in receptions. Uh, averaged 21 yards a catch wow. uh, junior year. Played both ways. Man, I don't know about you, but these kids – like we play both ways and specials, <laughs> like yeah, every day. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then, yeah, senior year led the led the conference. Um, Butter, my guy that that you've met before, yeah. was on the other side. He was number two, and then we had a tight end, like top five. So, um, was your team any good? Uh, middle of the road. All right. I think we had two ties. You, you guys competed. Yeah, it was all right. And uh, yeah, I was getting uh, I was getting a couple looks, mostly like Patriot League stuff. Right. Um, I remember I went to Fordham for. For a, a recruit visit, went to probably about five recruit visits. Ended up the last game, I, I broke my wrist and ended up with a, a cast on my arm through the spring. So I didn't play baseball, and a lot of them were hesitant to sign me uh, until I can get cleared medically. Uh, some of them wanted me to uh, prep a year, things like that. I remember I was I was being recruited for West Point. I went through oh, all right. that. And I remember they were like, "Why don't you go to Fort Monmouth and uh, you know and do a year?" I'm like, "Well, if I'm going to do that, I might as well go play a year." one right. double a at the time so went through i was the only wide receiver freshman that ended up making the traveling team i played in about four or five games um but i think i i didn't have the heart you right. know it, it was non-scholarship back then this is before the uh miles yeah, austin I, days. I, want, I want to say i want to say i'll go ahead finish you know no it, it um I, I wasn't going pro i wasn't getting a scholarship and they were sucking about like 90 percent of my time out right and i said you know what let me let me do something that's going to help me. I made a hard decision. It wasn't easy. I still have right. dreams that I have eligibility and then I'm going out and playing <laughs> and I can't find my helmet and stuff like that. It was the greatest of times. Is that that movie? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but no, I appreciate, you know, I had played my whole life. Like I said, I played from when I was five and then I'm 19 years old and it's, you got to yeah. make a decision. But I was like trying to make a decision for the rest of my life, not just these three years while I'm in school. Yeah, no, nah, I could dig it, man, because um, we definitely had um, some, like I, one of my best friends from um, Rockland, he walked on at Syracuse basketball. And, you know, I know how much he loved basketball because we played on the same high school basketball team. He's younger than me. But he had to make that tough decision to walk away. And then another one of my friends um, was a walk on. He's very successful now. Shout out to Josh Altman, uh, Million Dollar Listings. Uh, nice real estate guru, the Altman brothers, they're killing it out there. But um, he was a walk-on for three years. And then, you know, his senior year, he was just like almost to what you said, that, look, man, I dedicated all this time. I'm not going to get a shot. He was a kicker. So he was like, man, they ain't going to let me kick. <laughs> so um, what's I the point? should that route. <laughs> yeah, but you know what, though? At the end of the day, I feel, you know, playing on a football team at any level, if you play – at high school especially like it, it builds something in you you know a responsibility um you, you learn how to work with people you know that team that camaraderie thing and then if you know you play at the next level which is college um then it, it even builds more you know you got because it, you're on that job yeah together. <laughs> and it's and it's the responsibility you're putting that time in but they're next to you doing the same thing i mean waking up you know i mean that yeah. was when it really hit me you'd wake up and we would run yeah. And then we'd lift, and then we'd go to class, and then we'd have practice, and it was like... The life of man, a student athlete, yeah, and yeah. you're not on a scholarship. Right, right. And people always want to talk about, oh, well, you get a scholarship, but they don't know what goes into that scholarship. And another thing about that, shit, man, like, all right, they don't advise you about classes and stuff like that. You know, when I went to school, I didn't know about a major or anything. You know, most guys end up majoring in sociology or the biggest joke is African-American studies. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? What are you going to do with that? Any degree that you get um, as a student athlete, unless you went there at, with a plan to be like a doctor or accounting, where I feel a lot of the student athletes these days go with the plan. You know, they're, they're a little more educated as far as, you know, the process of college and, you know, the perks that you can get if you really – you know, take advantage of them, but they're not really laid out there for you. Yeah, I heard a great, uh, I think it was a podcast, and I forget which one, but uh, Dominique Foxworth talking about that, yeah. where he went to school, and they're basically like, well, here's some yeah. here's some majors that you can choose from, because they basically coincided with the football schedule. Absolutely. I took, um, my major was psychology, and I originally went to school to be a physical therapist. I'm like, yo, I'm going to do I did do too, because I, I had my <laughs> surgery on that wrist. And I was like, I can be an occupational therapist. Yo, I was like, I'm going to do physical therapy. 
But then I find out you got to take all these math classes and stuff. The science is what yeah. got me. The math uh, was all right, nah. but then the science classes is like, It was Whoa. the math and then the science, because that philosophy class I took my freshman year, I didn't, yo, I'm still having nightmares. <laughs> it didn't make sense. The philosophy does not make sense. But, um, but yeah, like, that, it, the scholarship compared to the time that you have to put in, put it like, yeah, you're definitely earning that scholarship, so... Those those small windows you talk about like high school football and the camaraderie that you have. I mean, my best friend, you know, a couple of my best friends now are guys that I played with, and I don't remember much from twenty years ago, twenty five right. years ago. But it's like that small window of you know three years say varsity, four years in high school. I mean, think about it as you know ten percent of really my life. Maybe right. It just has such a major impact on it. Even that year, year and a half that I played in college, you know, a lot of the guys that I still talk to, we just still have these funny, you know. War stories. I mean, we got in, you know, you would go to camp uh, in like August before anybody yeah, got absolutely. to campus. And campus so you had empty. Right, you, but you had like a built in group that you kind of already associated with. And it really made the transition, I think, to college a lot easier because you're not starting on day one and there's just this wide eyed freshman. You've already put in a couple of weeks like grinding with these guys. Yeah, you're already um, broken in. They've already done the freshman hazing or whatever that is or treated you like the freshman. Yeah, we had some assholes outside. Yeah. <laughs> There's some great guys, yeah. but man, Tell some of those guys are assholes. What do you think compared to about like athletes when during our time to the athlete now? Like what you what you see like when you hear these kids of like high school and college and then even watching these some of these pro athletes man like i hate to say they have it easy but you know my my school you know won uh, won championship state championship a couple years ago and i remember talking to the head coach who i'm still very close with and i'm saying man you let these wide receivers wear gloves like he didn't <laughs> let us wear gloves because he didn't want us to have an excuse if we drop the ball they're like they're right. blaming on the gloves then i see like odell making these one hand catches i try one of these things on at like dick sporting goods or something oh, like yeah. that they're like how do you drop? I don't know how these guys drop things. It was very easy for me as a wide receiver. You run a crisp route and you catch the ball. Right. Right. I wasn't the fastest guy. I had a little bit of speed, but I caught the ball if it was thrown near me right. with no gloves because right. I wasn't allowed to do it. And then we just talked about it before, playing both ways. They had such a big team. For us, it was like, yeah, we had a big team, but half the guys suck. So you got to do X, Y, and Z. I'm holding for kicks, you know, like right. backup quarterback type stuff. You know, I'm on the end, like chasing down, you know, chasing down punts. I'm returning punts. But that's, and just what, that's what we out. played for. I, I feel, you know, I never. I can't came imagine off the field. doing it any other way. Right. I can't. I never came off the field. I, I kicked off. I think I might have came off the field for you no. Know, I returned punts. Punt team. I wasn't the punter, so on punt team, I got to come off. But shit, I play running back on first and second down. If it's third and long, I go to wide receiver and get the <laughs> first down, and then go back to running back. So. You know, I definitely um, love the game then. I just see the evolution of, like, how these guys are coming along. I get to work at um, with a lot of high school kids now. I do the Nike opening. Well, I don't think it's Nike anymore. I do the opening and the Elite 11, which is um, camps that we go all over the country. There are 16. We go to about 16 locations all over the country, and we do a combine where the kids get to run their 40 do their um, do their vert, a bench press, well, a medicine ball throw, and then they get to compete. And we pick the top kids from those camps to come to. Um, it used to be Beaverton, Oregon, when it was Nike. Now we do it at the Star in Dallas. Uh, but these kids come out, they get to compete, they get all this gear, and well, talk they about the gear, man. Spoiled. You had the belly shirt back then, yeah, 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 <laughs> with those the, big those big mesh holes. That you yes, <laughs> before Under Armour, with them big ass Brian Bosworth shoulder pads. <laughs> I get to college and they just hand you the equipment, right? right. All right, so you're going to take this. I couldn't raise my arms above my head, and I'm like, "What? Give me, give me the small pads and stuff." But it was, yeah, it the neck roll, right? You had the neck roll, yeah, that did nothing. I actually had the, um, no, well, I had the cowboy collar because I would get stingers because my neck, like, um, I get those pinched nerves because my head will go back too far. So the cowboy collar kept my head from going back too far. And when I got to the NFL, they put like the big neck roll on the back of my on my back of my pads which was cool cuz you know the NFL was definitely another level it yeah every, everything seems up. so slick now but i mean even even those gloves right if when i did go to college i think the gloves that they gave us they they, they felt like golf gloves right or batting gloves right uh, it just the evolution that they have. So I don't want to say they have it easier and better equipment, but the games evolve. They've evolved. It, they, ca they're more catered to. I, I you know, I think um they're more they're the athlete today is definitely more catered to. Um 
And to be quite honest, I think they're more sensitive because they have to honestly deal with more. You know, they get judged a lot more because of social media. Like, I can't imagine, you know, going to play in a game and then somebody's critiquing my game from their couch. Yeah, what about even, like, locker room? You talk about hazing, right? Locker right. room hazing, stuff like that. Um yeah, man, social media and, and the shit that went down in those locker rooms and bullying, man, it was it was bad in retrospect. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah not nah, like when you – yeah, you're right. But so I guess that, that was to, the to time, extent, so we didn't even know really what, what was happening. So, yeah, to an extent, the, the athlete today is getting saved, but um, they're getting free passes, man, because I come from, you know, the, the era where you just you, – you sit down, you shut up, you do your job, and – you know when it's your when your number is called, you be ready to perform. Well, you so. feel, I feel like you've had that throughout your your pro career. You know, all the way through, kind of having that mentality. Talking about like I don't want to say pampered or catered, but even Steve Kerr came out uh, pretty recently talking about how he wishes basketball players would play soccer. How do you feel about like the exclusivity of just specializing in one sport? I think it's I think it's terrible. Um, just for the simple fact, you know playing that's how you develop other skills you know steve kerr probably makes that reference probably because of hand-eye coordination you know what i mean footwork you know maybe a lot of these big guys aren't as nimble um starting off playing soccer as a young kid could definitely help i played uh football baseball and basketball i wish i would have played lacrosse but i just couldn't fit it fit it in um with all the seasons but just my even now um one of my good friend's kid is t she's telling me that um you know their son has to play he plays on the high school basketball team in order to play on the high school basketball team you have to play on the travel team so when do you get to play any other sports like so I, yeah exactly so what i tell what what's happening is these these guys these men uh these leaders of these different leagues have found a way to monopolize off of kids they're monopolizing off the youth that's all that they're doing having all these different practices, telling parents that, yo, know, if you don't come to this tournament or if you don't uh, play on this team in the spring when it's not even basketball team, you probably won't make the team in the fall. And, like, shit, that's bullying a little bit, man. You know what I'm saying? Quid pro quo, me, I think. Yeah, you're giving, you're giving uh, <laughs> the, the national uh, vernacular is. A 12-year-old yeah. ki 12, 12, kid an ultimatum. And with my kid, you know, I have a – my daughter's 11 – she just made the travel AAU volleyball team. So I'm just curious. I'm about to get into this world. I, I guess I'm about to see, um, you know, how it, how it really works. But I know one thing. I'll take her ass out quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's easy, even easier today. You know, the reason I ended up playing football, my dad has three brothers and himself. They were all soccer. Three of them were goalies. Right. My mother's side had three brothers. They all played football. Well, two played football. One ran track. So... My dad went to sign me up for soccer, but being in the city of Trenton, there was no city soccer league. So we had to go out to the suburbs and sign up there. There was a wait list there. They're like, well, why don't he just play football? So, you know, I don't know how it is now, but even back then you hear about, you know, the, the access and the ability to play certain sports, you know. So Steve Kerr, maybe it's not so easy for soccer is probably a little easier now. Right. But, I mean, you know, inner city Trenton, I'm, look, I'm not, I'm not some, like, right, inner right, city right. – like kid per se, but yeah, I was born. I was born in a city, and there were limited options. You know, it was basically baseball and CYO basketball that you right. got through the Catholic school. Shit, that's what I played: baseball, CYO basketball, and uh, pop Warner football. And I didn't go to the Catholic school. I just would have to go to those religion classes on Saturday. <laughs> that's what my kids I, do now. <laughs> that what I would that I would duck out of. Um, but yeah, man, this is gonna be a pretty dope thing that we're doing. Look, we are two guys that have three daughters. Yeah, there's some stories there. There's some stories and there. And they're all about the same age, so we're going through a lot of it together. Your, yours are a little bit more, like maybe a year, a couple months ahead, so I, I kind of have some warning signs, but man, nothing prepares you for fatherhood, especially three girls. Yeah, man. Um, I, I, Right now we're having the, if I'm having any issue, it's getting my oldest one to be nicer to the middle one. You know what I mean? My, like, my oldest, I don't, she's not a bully, by so no it, sense right. she's like little mom it's bossy right? so we're like yeah my we, daughter's bossy we have parents my wife right. and myself let us parent yes. she wants to tell everybody what to do the the middle one then 
can't take it from her, so she gives the little one. Shit. Oh yeah, so we got the same thing going <laughs> on. We definitely got the same. And thing the little going one on. is like you know four, three and a half she's going, going on, going on eighteen. Right. She's like the she's the girly girl princess right. that I got to worry about. Like right. that's what really scares me. But she don't want to put up with shit from yeah, either exactly. of the other two. She talks, <laughs> she talks crazy to them. So exactly, like so, the oldest one does it to the middle one. The middle one does it to the youngest one. The youngest one ain't taking shit from nobody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, that's the that's the dynamic right there. So yeah, man, that's pretty. But, yeah, cool. man, fatherhood. Some of the some of the business stuff, man. We'll we'll get into hopefully in a, in a couple episodes too. I mean, you you came from like you said, eleven year pro, and I remember what you said, and and you took advantage. You invested in yourself. You did the different classes. You, you educated yourself. You surrounded yourself by good people, but really took took the ownership upon yourself, which was nice. And you're doing all kinds of things now, whether it's investments or, um, you know, but doing so where you get your hands dirty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, man, you know what? Being from the East Coast, New York, like you, I'm kind of like you. Like, look, I grew up in the suburbs outside of New York City, but we're hustlers, man. You know what I'm saying? Unless it was given to you as a child, which it wasn't given to either one of us, you have to know how to get out there and hustle. And granted, I got a schol- I earned a scholarship. I went and played in the NFL for 11 years and made a, a lot of money. But um, I had a great agent who was a New York guy that moved out to Cali, um, Gary Richard, rest in peace. And, like, each offseason, I spent a ton of time around him, and he kind of taught me about life and about business and how to go at it, how people are going to try and get over and all these different things that I've come to experience, um, you know, in my time after football because he passed away right after uh, – he passed away right before I retired. So – Unless I just wanted to sit around and count my money, I had to get out and be active in this world. And I, like I said earlier in this podcast, I always knew I was going to expand further. So that's why I took it upon myself to go back and get my master's. And, you know, I liked working with you on different projects that are in the marketing and branding space that I'm not even in. I've invested in a company, um, a branding company um, that's doing well. You know, I'm getting distributions, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I can't be mad at that. But I like to learn, man. That's 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 what life's about for me right now. And also, um, you know, for my daughters, they really never see me play ball. So I got to show them some type of work ethic. Well, even what you described about the exposure and the things that you took, uh, you took the initiative to do, um, you know, I think a lot of times in the sports space, they not only – some guys don't do that or take it for granted. I mean, you know, we, we do some advising. You and I have done it. I currently still do it with these guys that are going into the draft and entering the draft. And these guys are so one, you know, one focus, which is good, which yeah. is what they need, I'm sure you would say. But that plan B, it's like, all right, if you can't focus on that, you're going to need it eventually. So how do you prepare yourself for that? I mean, even your career, you know, stand out and and all pros and stuff and then you get hurt at the right. end and that certainly changed the dynamic did that play any role into your mentality or did you always kind of have that that mentality anyway or was that kind of a wake-up call like maybe i should start thinking about what's next um at that point i you know what i don't know what i if i hadn't gotten hurt i don't know what my course would have been life after football because that was the last uh, year of my contract with the Titans. Um, I was already on my way to a Pro Bowl. And, yeah, I pro- Carlos Dansby signed for $26 million that year. I just would have asked for twenty and probably gotten it. You know what I mean? So, honestly, in hindsight, I didn't need a, another $20 million from football. You know, I mean, I, trust me, I would have loved to have <laughs> it. I didn't want to get hurt. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, you know, I think that – that injury kind of made me, you know, obviously heal up, do another year with the Giants. But, like, yeah, so what you were saying, like, yeah, it was time to get your shit together because this ride is about over. <laughs> and, that, I mean, that's something we'll get into uh, when we start talking family and life and stuff right. in the future. But going from New York suburbs down to Tennessee, playing in a small market, having three all pros, only having one pro bowl. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> right? It's uh, big fish, little pond, but – you know, then going back up to New York, major yeah. market. But now, but now you're raising your family down in Nashville. Yeah, man, it was it, it was it's like what the most ironic thing to me is is that I started playing football in New York with the New City Rams, and I ended off 
And then I went to Syracuse and played right. college football, and my pro career ended with the New York team. I officially retired as a Titan because that's where I put in all the work, and I feel that any time um, a modern-day gladiator has an opportunity to go back to where he did all his battles, you know, that's where the journey ends. You know, bury that old soul there, and, right. you know, that's where the fans will remember him and always love him. So, and my kids are were born there. There are business opportunities there. I have a brand that I haven't really used yet. I Yeah, I'm about to start doing something in 2020 there. Um, I invested in my first franchise, so I'm looking forward to that. So. You know, when you and I were down there, too, it was interesting. We went to, uh, you know, some educational places. We went to some entrepreneurial places. We went to the city of Nashville. And one thing they said is, hey, Titans are still relatively young. The Predators are still relatively young. We have the minor league baseball team getting MLS. But when people come to the city, it's usually aspiring country music stars. Right. They never – they, they told us we don't have at they were so happy to have you there because they don't have athletes that come back and say I want to get involved I want to reinvest in this town yeah I mean look man I made I made over what 30 40 million dollars in Nashville as an athlete um you know 10 years removed from my sport I feel that I have the business acumen that I was like trying to develop I've developed that and I'm ready to give back to the community do some fun things um like I said, I got young kids there. We live in the community. They go to school there, and I think it's going to be great um, for myself, business-wise, to grow my um, my business relationships in that city as the city expands. And, you know, just set examples for new Titans that retire and, you know, want to try and find a way, or not just Titans, but it plays into our transition um, blueprint where it makes it easier for um, our colleagues over there to kind of show new um, potential clients. Like, look, this is what our founder has done mm -hmm. since he retired. This is his path. And I, and I like being the blueprint for, you know, transition. How proactive are current younger Titans with reaching out or, or picking your brand or even revering you in certain cases? Or, uh, or do you kind of let them do their thing? And if Yeah, I, I totally let them do their thing. If they run into me, man, and, you know, I'll shoot them my number if they want to get in touch with me. But I, I remember being a player. It's very hard to, um, you know, get things done during the season. But if some reach out to me, it doesn't even have to just be anyone on the Titans. You know, with that whole Nike thing, um, well, you know, the we high school football kid, are, yeah, right. I've like had guys that I've been around since they were 17 that uh, I saw when they were 17 years old when they were in 11th grade saying if they can just stay on the right path, they'll be first round draft picks. And lo and behold, a lot of them are. So um, even the ones that aren't first rounders that just get into the league and, you know, that's gratifying. They'll be like, oh, Coach Bully, you know, so <laughs> Coach, I rock with it. You did a little internship. Right with yeah. the Steelers, Pittsburgh. We'll see. I always try, I try and keep those um, keep those gates open. And I'm not saying I want to get into coaching this year. I mean, if it was the right opportunity, maybe. I mean, the right offer. I don't think they could pay me enough right now. But um, yeah, down the line, I definitely want to. You know, they, I, they give you any shit about that terrible towel incident? Uh, we already broke. We already made amends over that, man. <laughs> they went and won the Super Bowl. Yeah. So like, look, what are, what is there to talk about? But yeah, Pittsburgh travels well. Um, and they flooded our stadium that day uh, when I stomped a terrible towel and we kicked the shit out of them. So that's what happens, man. Well, speaking of uh, traveling well, one thing we want to wrap some of the shows with is like what's popping on social media. What are we seeing? What are we hearing? And I want to throw it to you because I saw something that was popping on your feed. Uh, <laughs> first talking about the way the Chiefs were traveling down there. To, yeah, they travel well. To uh, to Nashville. I was down there for the Eagles game last year. They travel well. They travel well. We got, got beat. That was kind of miserable. Yeah, most of the teams that travel <laughs> well to Tennessee get that ass beat. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, but you, you were vocal about that. And how do you feel about being vocal about the team and the fans and calling things the way you see them? That's just me. I've always been that way. You know, um, anyone that's anyone that knows me, anyone that's played on a team with me. Um, look, man, life life was very honest to me early in my life. So I feel that, you know, if I could handle it as a young kid, you should be able to handle it as an adult. But, you know, it's too much gray area sometimes. I think better communication comes when, um, you know, it's direct. And obviously I don't – not going around trying to be, you know, an asshole to anyone or anything like that. But, you know, 
I have strong opinions sometimes. Sometimes I voice them more strongly than others. So, so part two of that is because I saw that, and there's a lot of red <laughs> in that in that stadium, calling that out. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm seeing these selfies from the sideline, and then next thing you know, you were asked oh, yeah. not to be on the sideline anymore. I was, uh, yeah, yeah. That that's that kind of, you know what, man? It, it. What's the protocol for former players and, I, and access that they have at stadium? I don't, on, I don't go to day? enough. I don't go to enough games to even know, honestly. Um, but yeah, man, I was on the sidelines. Um, I saw my man Tim Shaw. How's he doing? And he's doing he's doing as best as as good as he can for you know he um, Tim Shaw has ALS he came down with ALS several years ago and he's still fighting you know he's still fighting leading that charge um, for that terrible disease but uh, I just kind of stepped to the back got out of the way behind the bleachers you know what I mean and I was just gonna watch the first half first quarter a little bit of first quarter from the sidelines just to get the feel the speed of the game again whatever you know something nostalgic and then. Security came doing their job. <laughs> so you have to leave the sideline. I'm like, I do media. Like, I was trying to think of something. They're like, well, if you're not actively doing media right now, we're going to have to ask you to leave the sidelines. And, you know, they were just doing their job. Okay. No one from the Titans it organization. The organization. It was, all right. You know what I mean? So it was like... I was just being pissy at the time. <laughs> That's always my step back when I'm dealing with customer service. Yeah. So I got to step back and say, I know it's not you. Right, right, I know right. You're and doing I clearly, I said that to them. I was like, look, I know. However, you guys let me explain. To you. Yes, I was, I was a little perturbed, but it was all good, man. I just, it was like, you know what? It, it's like when I go to get, I just float around. Like, it feels like in high school when you're just walking around the halls and everybody's in class. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it was cool. I went to a couple suites. Went to the press box, but I, best seat in the house for me is at home, man. I'm with you on that. Well, speaking of social media, you can find us at theoutsidegame.com and the Outside Game on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Where can we find you, KB? You can find me at KBull53 on Twitter, Keith Bullock 53 on Instagram. Yeah, you're like me. I'm all over the place. So I got yeah, yeah. We're not, <laughs> I got HH Reynolds. And we preach that all all under one right, handle. But we but. St- <laughs> yeah, we started early, you know what I mean? Like and then you just kinda add on and add on and whatever's left for you. HH Reynolds on Twitter, DP HHR on Instagram, and find us again at the outside game. But Hope you enjoyed us. Thanks for sticking around this long. We're going to have guests. We're going to have some banter. We're going to talk about, I don't know, life, sports. Bringing you hot fire. Yeah. Hot takes, man. Uh, until next week, till next show, I'm Don Bobia. That's Mr. Monday Night Keith Bullet. And we're out. Peace out.